Hi all, this is Rajiv and Jung from PhD Expertise, and today we'll be talking with our special guest, Dr. Sean Lubner. Dr. Lubner is a mechanical engineer research scientist at MIT with experience in both applied product development and fundamental scientific research. Welcome, Dr. Lubner, and thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. So we have a full slate of questions for you, but we wanted to start off with your graduate education and that background. <clears throat> uh, specifically, you completed your PhD at UC Berkeley and received a variety of awards, um, including NSF fellowships with a uh, fellowship with top distinction. In your view, what are some of the tips to successfully obtain an NSF fellowship? I'll first say, and this is true for the NSF fellowship and for everything, it's my personal philosophy that there is just a, a huge, huge influence from luck that is beyond your control. So it's important, I think, to always acknowledge going into anything that, you know, do your best, um, but recognize that there's more at play than just your own influence. Uh, so I am very grateful for many things that just by good fortune uh, were in my favor. Um, and then the other kind of, again, cliche, but I think very true piece of advice is you can only get something that you apply for. Um, so step number one, you have to apply for the fellowship or any other fellowship that you want. I'll admit that, you know, it, it's, it's been a few years since I, I wrote my NSF fellowship and I'm not sure if... Uh, Things have changed much since then. I know it seems like every year, everything gets more competitive, but when I was writing mine, my application, um, I really just tried to convey my, my genuine enthusiasm for science and, and for its application. Um, and I think that if you are genuinely excited about what you're doing and you can convey that in your research, uh, in your, your writing, um, I think that helps a lot. Uh, also, and this is uh, true for anyone who's going to do additional proposal writing beyond uh, just the, the NSF fellowship, read the instructions. <laughs> I know that, again, sounds kind of trivial, but they get an enormous number of applicants. And so they are looking for reasons to reject people. And one of the easiest reasons to reject any application, whether it's for NSF or, or something else, is if it just doesn't you know, fit the description of what they're looking for. So uh, I, think, I think it's Broader impacts and intellectual merit are kind of the two grading criteria, and, and they'll they'll release you know what they're looking for specifically. And so just make sure that the way you've written it um, really does speak to what they want to hear, it, sincerely so. Um, but you know if you go off on a, a long heartfelt tangent that's not applicable, it might be moving, but that's not going to help you with the fellowship. So that, that's fairly high level, but you know I, I think that as cliche as it sounds, those core pieces of advice can take you pretty far. Okay, no, that's that's great advice, and I'm sure a lot of folks will look back at that and say, "Wow, that <laughs> that was helpful." Um, <laughs> yeah, and so with your NSF fellowship, you were you know you were in the PhD program. What were some of your your main projects, focus areas as a PhD student? I was doing a PhD in the mechanical engineering department, um, but I'd say I'm also very much a, a physicist at heart, and so you know mechanical engineering is an incredibly broad uh, department. Uh, it's got many many different sub areas. And I think I landed in one of the more sort of physics-y sub areas. So I was looking at nanoscale heat transfer. So this is going all the way down to the fundamental energy carriers of heat, um, which in most solids is phonons. These are uh, quantized bundles of atomic vibrational energy, um, but really trying to connect that fundamental understanding up to macroscopic heat transfer phenomena. And so my PhD kind of reflected this multi-scale uh, examination of the transport of energy. So initially, um, I was working on some more macro scale, micro to macro scale uh, sensors. So it was taking a well-established technique um, where you essentially do a thermal version of sonar. It's not exactly analogous, but conceptually that gets you the right idea where you send a thermal wave into a material. And then by doing that, you can measure properties of that material, including below the surface, even though your sensor lives on the outside. Uh, and so uh, working to adapt this for some new systems, looked at some uh, biological systems. So that was also a fun uh, lesson in terms of uh, collaboration. Um, I got to work with some excellent scientists at University of Minnesota who brought in more of the biomedical engineering expertise. Um, and it was a great introduction for me to kind of get my hands dirty in uh, how to build uh, measurement systems, how to do the data analysis, how to design um, experiments, uh, a good introduction. Um, and then kind of as I progressed, I became more and more interested in some of the more fundamental uh, aspects. And so my length scales shrunk as I progressed through my PhD. Um, so towards the end, I, I started looking at specifically phonon transport. Uh, so again, adapting some existing techniques of ultra-fast optical pump probe systems. So these are lasers 
that can measure transport properties on down to picosecond timescales, which wow. is, I mean, to put that in context, that's the time it takes for light to travel, I think it's a few millimeters, so ultra short timescales. Um, and so if you do these surface measurements with these really, really short timescales, you can actually look at the transport of phonons themselves, and you can start to resolve what types of phonons are contributing to different kinds of transport based on properties of your material. You know, is it single crystal? Does it have grains in it? Um, so that's that's sort of the, the bird's eye view of kind of the, the chart uh, that I, I went through. I also worked on some side projects with some of my lab mates. Actually, one of the first things I did when I started my PhD was help one of my lab mates in an experiment that he was designing on um, building a photon uh, thermal diode. So essentially create a system such that heat can flow more easily in one direction than in the opposite direction. And I think that was fantastic for me because I was able to immediately attach onto a project and kind of learn from working with people uh, some of the, the, the basic skills um, before getting completely thrown into the deep end with my own project. Oh, wow. <clears throat> Those are, you know, you different link skills that challenge itself. There's a lot to learn there. So that's, that's quite remarkable. And I think it seems like you were set up pretty well for your next venture you went into you went you went to lawrence berkeley national labs mm -hmm. and um after the completion of your phd and you were even selected as a seaberg fellow and that allows for supplemental research funding can you talk a little bit about your your main focus areas at lbl sure um although i will start with the caveat that i i certainly broaden my horizon so there's a lot of topics that i that i looked at so main focus areas depends on how general uh, words you'll permit me to use um, <laughs> But yes, I'll also comment, you know, if you are fortunate enough to get any of these awards, you know, an NSF fellowship, or in my case, the Seaborg Research Fellowship, um, one of the great benefits is that it can often give you flexibility uh, to work on either things that you find more interesting or to collaborate more broadly than you normally would. Um, and I believe that it is really impossible to predict what you're going to be working on more than a couple of years out into the future. And so the more opportunities you have to expose yourself to different collaborations or different ideas, the more likely it is that you'll find something that you're really excited about or something new or something fun. Um, so that's, I think, the biggest secret benefit of having that flexibility. Um, but yeah, so at LBL, again, um, luck played a big role. My timing was very fortunate. It was right around when um, Ravi Prasher, uh, who's still at LBL, was joining, and he had also brought in uh, Dr. Suman Kar, uh, another phenomenal scientist. And so I ended up working closely with both of them throughout my career at LBL. And over those few years, we sort of built this thermal energy group <clears throat> at LBL. Uh, and that was just a really fun and exciting time because it was saying, let's take everything that we collectively understand about energy transport and, and the heat transport, and then look at what we think are some of the most pressing, sometimes existential technological crises. Um, in the world and see where we can take this, this knowledge and apply it. Uh, and so we started working on a variety of projects. We worked on some water desalination. We worked on building energy. More recently, I've been working on large scale uh, energy storage for decarbonization. Um, recently also been working on carbon capture of CO2. Uh, I started working also on the, the cold end of the temperature scale. So looking at, can you shield phonons to protect qubits and quantum computers? Many people also started expanding the toolkit. So we started bringing in machine learning as, as another approach to try to optimize oh. systems. Um, so this is one of the reasons also why I love science is you are constantly learning. Um, you're getting to bring in these different techniques and tools that then let you leapfrog ahead in your own research. Uh, but I, I think really I found some fantastic mentors at LBL who really helped show me how you can <clears throat> take what you know and apply it in a different direction. Um, so my, my first project as a postdoc was working on batteries, electrochemical batteries, but it was taking those same sensors that I mentioned from the start of my PhD and adapting them to work on batteries, which is something I would never have thought of previously, but it turns out that it's a great fit. And even though this technique was well known in a different community, it hadn't been brought over to batteries before and it suddenly revealed all these insights um, that weren't possible with the existing measurement techniques. And then over the years, we also realized that it could be used to measure other properties, not just thermal. So, you know, lithium concentrations in batteries. Uh, and we have some ideas for how it might apply beyond that. And so, yeah, things can just very naturally progress when you work with new people who have a different perspective on what are some of the big problems that need to be solved. 
uh, maybe that was a bit rambling. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that was that was helpful. I especially some of the, uh, and we'll get into this a little bit later. But the some of the the actual work that you you've done lithium ion batteries, where both of us are uh, familiar with that. It's a big topic now. So um, you know, that, looking forward to hearing about that. But you're you know now you're currently you're currently at MIT. Your office kind of reflects the fact that it's a, a recent move, right? And, yep, uh, yeah. bare walls still. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, congratulations for that. But what yes. are you, you know, what what prompted the move? What what are what are kind of next steps for you here? Sure. Uh, so I absolutely loved my time at LBL. Um, I love all the people there, uh, and I was honestly very sad to leave. So um, it had nothing to do with any any uh, you know lack of fulfillment there. Uh, honestly, it was a, a two-body problem, as many academics have to face, and which is a good reminder that you know we get really excited about science, but you also want to do sort of a, a life optimization, um, which may include things beyond just just work. And so that brought me over to Cambridge, uh, to Massachusetts. And very fortunately, again for me, um, I was able to find that there were some really good places for me to fit in in this community as well, and I'm still figuring that out. Uh, but uh, sort of that, that was the, the prompt for the move, but I'm, I'm still in uh, close collaboration with all my colleagues back at LBL. I'm still supervising some students and postdocs there. And, you know, as far as I view it, your, your academic family only grows, uh, and that's, that's all positive. Yeah, no, that's a great perspective uh, to be able to have. And there are, I mean, I think the, one of the takeaways is there, there are more elements to um, your career than just the actual career portion of it. There, there's the optimization that you, you speak up. So now I will shift gear to uh, some technical question. Our viewer sure. always interested in those questions to ask the experts of different uh, areas. In your recent uh, manuscript, you performed the in situ characterization of battery thermal resistance. Can you talk about some of the implications of this type of work? Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I briefly mentioned kind of the high level how this these measurements work. You've got a sensor, um, you apply periodic heating at the surface, which creates a thermal wave that will then diffuse down into your substrate, which in this case was a battery. Um, what's particularly favorable is that the depth to which that heat diffuses depends on the frequency of your wave. So even though your sensor lives on the outside, you can control how far into the battery you're looking by controlling the frequency of the wave that you're sending into the battery. Um, and so we found that this let us do operando measurements. So non-invasive measurements on the subsurface properties of the batteries while they are in operation, which allowed us to see some properties in their evolution that previously no one could observe in situ. You know, people had taken batteries and, and cut them open and, and taken the, them apart and measured the individual components, which is very insightful, but you're never really gonna get the full picture of how all the components interact with each other during charging and discharging unless you can do that measurement in a live battery. Uh, and that's where I think that the big opportunity laid. And so, right, one of the big discoveries that we made was that previously, if you had taken the thermal resistance of each layer in a battery, right? If you take a battery and you open it up, um, don't do that. <laughs> it's, it's very <laughs> hazardous, but in, in a controlled setting, you open it up um, inside, you'll usually, especially if it's a lithium ion battery, you see this jelly roll structure, which is this multi-layered structure. Um, each layer is very thin, you know, tens of microns, uh, about the thickness of a piece of paper. And it's all these layers rolled up together very tightly. And people had been trying to figure out what's the thermal transport in that battery. And that's really important because if you're making something like an electric vehicle and you wanna charge that car very quickly, uh, that's going to generate a lot of heat that you need to dissipate out of the battery before really bad things happen. And actually right now, one of the, one of the barriers preventing more um, broad adoption of electric vehicles is range anxiety and the inability to rapidly charge your car. So this is a real problem. Um, and so we wanna understand what heat transfer inside the battery looks like. People have tried to model this, but again, all they've been able to do is take measurements of individual layers of the battery. And then from that theoretically predict what the total thermal transport through the battery should be. Uh, but that didn't match up with experiment if you measure the thermal transport through a full battery. And so there was this question of why is there a mismatch? And unfortunately, the real battery had far worse thermal properties than what your predictions would have said. Um, and what we were able to see, because we had these non-invasive sensors that could look at the battery and sort of profile its thermal transport properties during operation, is that the heat was getting stuck in between the layers. You see, so it wasn't the layers themselves. The problem was the thermal contact resistance from one layer to the next 
which is specifically something you cannot see if you're taking the battery apart and measuring each layer individually. Uh, and then, so we also did some theoretical modeling to understand sort of from a, a micro scale picture, why that thermal contact resistance is so bad. And so hopefully this understanding can lead to us better designing batteries that have improved thermal transport, which will be one of the barriers preventing fast uh, charging. And it will also increase the safety of batteries. You're less likely to have thermal runaway events, which is a technical way of saying <laughs> battery catching on fire and exploding, um, if you're able to dissipate that heat more quickly. Uh, and again, this is not just having some external cooling system, because no matter how quickly you can pull heat away from the surface of the battery, if the heat is generated inside the battery, it still needs to get to the surface first. And the only way it can do that is by going through the battery materials themselves. And so there's no getting around engineering the thermal transport of the battery materials themselves. We've also then since found that the same technique can be applied, as I mentioned earlier, to look at other properties in the battery. So for example, um, we have found that you can measure the distribution of lithium concentration within a single layer, in this case, the anode. So 70 microns thick. And you can look at how that changes as you're charging the battery. So you can look at gradients form in your lithium concentration. Normally, before these techniques, if you wanted to get that kind of measurement in a battery that's operating, you would need neutrons or maybe intense x-rays. You know, but now we can do this as a benchtop measurement. So this can further reveal insights for what's really going on inside the battery while it's actually charging and discharging. You know, not, not taking it apart, but look at the battery while it's alive and understand what's happening inside. Those are sounds very exciting. You kind of already touched on my next question, which is uh, fast charging is really a hot topic in the EV, mm -hmm. in the battery world. And uh, you were part of this team that did a literature a review on this uh, thermal management during fast charging. Um, I know as we shift from a room temperature to a higher temperature to enable those fast charging, can you share some of uh, those interesting results from your literature survey? Probably should have said this earlier, and it might be clear to the, the people listening to the conversation, but this is really a team effort. So when I say we or I am, I'm speaking on behalf of many very talented scientists that all work together. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's just sort of how science is done. So. Um, I'd say one of the most interesting uh, takeaways that, that we figured out is in some ways, it's a fortunate coincidence that existing lithium ion batteries work so well at room temperature. Uh, I don't think people question that because it just worked out that way. But if you think about what's going on inside of a battery when you're charging it or discharging it, you have competing effects that are all somewhat controlled by temperature. So on the one hand, you have the diffusion of lithium ions, so mass diffusion inside the battery, right? So when you're charging a battery, you're pushing electrons through some external circuit, but then to maintain charge neutrality, since the electrons are negative, the positively charged, in this case, lithium ions have to diffuse inside, right? That's a big difference, say, between a battery and a capacitor, is that the charge inside, it moves through ions, so big, massive mass diffusion. That diffusion will be accelerated at higher temperatures. So your mass diffusion resistance drops at higher temperatures, which is a good thing. You want as low resistance as possible. So that might make you think like, ah, you know, we want really high temperatures for batteries. However, that high temperature will accelerate the kinetics of other reactions as well. So there are some bad reactions that happen inside the battery, bad in the sense of they are irreversible, they'll consume your lithium, they could lead to degradation of the battery. So going to high temperature also accelerates that. When you look at these two competing effects, you can essentially find what is an optimal temperature that gives you the most benefit of reducing resistance for the beneficial diffusion without accelerating um, you know, degradation. And for current lithium ion batteries, um, it looks like room temperature, if you had to pick one temperature, um, is a pretty good one. Um, but as we look to sort of next generation batteries in different chemistries or solid state, uh, it may actually not be room temperature that is optimal. And that's, that's to me anyway, uh, sort of a very interesting and counterintuitive result. So kind of to follow up there, there are you know, there are concerns with lithium plating that mm. might happen, um, particularly during <clears throat> fast charging. It seems like there's a balance here between, you know, uh, some of the, the, the thermal effects that you're talking about, basically heat being trapped within an element of the cell and, and the balance between that and lithium plating. Did you see anything in your work regarding mm. lithium plating? And, and, and how Yeah, that, how yeah, exactly. Works? So, so you're right. I, I kept saying, you know, heat getting trapped is, is one of the, the barriers to overcome. Lithium plating very much is, is another big one. You know, exactly as you were describing, if you imagine you have your anode here, kind of cross-section view, when you're charging, you're trying to push lithium into that anode 
to store that. And that is mass diffusion and the lithium is arriving from one side, but then it has to diffuse through your anode. And that's all, you know, rate balances. But if your lithium is showing up and arriving at a higher flux, then it can diffuse into your anode. It's going to start backlogging and accumulating on the surface. And eventually the driving force is going to be strong enough to cause plating at that interface. Usually once that's happened, you're out of luck. Um, it's generally impossible to recover that lithium, at least fully. And so you've lost capacity. And so when we were able to look inside the battery and see these gradients of lithium concentration that I mentioned earlier, one of the most potentially useful applications of that is seeing when you're getting close to lithium plating, right? Because you can imagine if lithium plating is happening when you cannot diffuse into your anode quickly enough, there's gonna be a hallmark strong concentration gradient that shows up first because you're gonna to start to see the lithium piling up within the anode, right? If diffusion were really easy, there'd be almost no gradient. You'd have a uniform distribution of lithium throughout your anode. But if it's got a lot of diffusion resistance, especially relative to how quickly the lithium is coming in, you get that gradient and there's a lot more concentration where it's arriving. And being able to see that in a live battery without having to open it up um, can be really valuable both to understand and prevent lithium plating. In addition to the lithium battery as a form of energy storage, I know you also work on another form of energy storage technology, the high temperature thermal energy storage. Can you give us some examples of the type of materials can be used? A second part of the question is what needs to be addressed technically and commercially in order to see a large scale such project being implemented? Great question. And this is something that I'm very excited about. And I think is very important. Uh, so recently, like really largely in the last few years, several researchers have all been converging on this idea of, can we use thermal energy storage as a very inexpensive, safe and deployable way to store large quantities of energy? Uh, so again, the, the reason that you wanna do this is because the ultimate goal is decarbonization and completely switching over to old renewable energy. The reason we can't do that now is because renewable energy is intermittent, right? So we actually have extremely inexpensive solar and wind power available, but only when the sun is shining and when the wind is blowing. But, you know, industry and, you know, commercial manufacturing goes 24 seven and you want to be able to turn your lights on at night, which means you really want a reliable and dispatchable supply of energy. And so you kind of have this intermittent source of energy, but you want reliable um, demand and energy. So to buffer between that, you need a large amount of energy storage. So you can take all that extra wind and solar when you get it and then deploy it when you need it. In principle, you could do this with say electrochemical batteries, but it turns out that at the scales we're talking, that is prohibitively expensive. Now, maybe in the future, we can bring those costs down, but right now, most projections say that would be too expensive. So people have been considering other options. And there are, I should clarify, a, a zoo of different possible options for energy storage. And I'd be happy to touch on a few of them. Um, so I'm going to be focusing on thermal energy storage because I think that's one of the most exciting for large scale, but there are many, many other options. We will invariably need to employ a variety of different options for different situations. But for the really, really large scale, um, what you want is to optimize for inexpensive material costs for what you're using to store the energy. Uh, because even if you have to do energy conversion, say heat to electricity, that is going to be diluted out in cost by how much just storage material you have if you're storing enough energy to power a city for a week. And so one of the advantages of thermal energy storage is in principle, uh, you can use anything to store heat. You just heat it up. Uh, but then you can start to be a little bit more you know, selective and intelligent in how you pick your materials. Uh, if you can go to really high temperatures, then you're fitting more energy into the same volume of material uh, that you're using to store that energy. So your effective price for energy storage has gone down. So you want a material that can survive very high temperatures. Uh, and then, of course, you want a material that's very inexpensive, um, so very abundant materials. Uh, so, you know, silicon, carbon, these kinds of materials. You want usually something that uh, can convert electricity into heat very easily. And so you want it to be self-heating, which means it needs to be somewhat electrically conductive. In principle, you could have heaters that indirectly heat your material, but that additional energy conversion step is going to make the whole system a bit more complicated and a bit more expensive. So we kind of outlined a bunch of different properties that we want this material to have. And so we've been exploring how do we make material, you know, that has good electrical conductivity, good thermal conductivity, it's mechanically robust, it can survive high temperatures, it's inexpensive, it's got good energy density. Um, and so, as I said, there are a few people looking at different options. Some people are looking at molten silicon, so, uh, you know, as a liquid. Um, some people are looking at phase change 
materials. So again, possibly silicon or silicon based alloys. You can store heat as, as latent heat. Um, some people are just looking at simple graphite. You know, that's pretty straightforward and you can take that up to really high temperature. And then we've been looking at kind of making a ceramic graphite composite. So this is again, a, a solid form of energy storage. But again, big picture, what this looks like is you just get some giant block of material and you heat it up to a really high temperature, insulated of course, and then later you can pull that heat out, that energy out as you need it and convert it back into electricity using a heat engine. Or you can just provide it directly as heat. Because something else that people often don't realize is that if you look at how we use energy as an entire country, about a third of it is as heat. So we usually just think electricity, but we use an enormous amount of energy as heat. And this is mostly in manufacturing. And a lot of it is at high temperature heat too. So if you're trying to produce say glass or cement or, or steel, you need heat at temperatures over a thousand degrees Celsius. So if you're already storing your energy as heat, that's just more favorable. Um, so, you know, really we're, we're looking at what are the most inexpensive ways, most, uh, you know, kind of high utility ways to store energy uh, so that we can not have to rely on fossil fuels. Great, very interesting. Uh, Dr. Lubner, uh, we really appreciate you being with us today. And thanks to all the people watching this. If you have any questions for Dr. Lubner, please send them to team at gmail.com. And we'll see you next time. Thanks everyone. Thanks for having me.